Okay, yeah, so my talk is, is how um, Erlang has infiltrated Cisco uh, in, in the last few years after a acquisition of a, a Swedish company uh, that I used to work for. Uh, what do you see now, blue screen? Okay, here we go. Okay, so Cisco bought a company called TLF in, in 2014, uh, but the company itself was founded in uh, 2005 by a bunch of Erlang people that came from Ericsson originally, but, but uh, founded a few other companies uh, along the way. And, and they have offices now in, in uh, Stockholm, in uh, Skellefteå, which is north of Sweden, and uh, these days we're also doing some uh, progr Erlang programming uh, on top of or within the products uh, here in San Jose. Uh, we are currently around 180 people in the engineering part of, of, uh, this, uh, of these, this family of products, uh, not counting uh, sales, uh, but about, I think, roughly 30, 35 people are working on the Erlang part of, of the uh, product and mainly, almost only, exclusively in Stockholm still. And the products that they are working uh, uh, with in Stockholm is called ConfD and NSO, and here we are, um, we have a bunch of products here that we are working on that's built on top of these products, but only two of them use Erlang. So, so I'll only briefly mention those two in uh, the end. Okay. Okay, so Erlang at uh, Cisco. Uh, so th this, this talk actually was held two years ago by a, one of my colleagues. Uh, so the, the figure that we are shipping two million devices per year uh, with Erlang in them is his uh, guesstimates, so, so I don't have any, don't fact check me on this, but it's, I think it's a rough estimate that around two million devices per year, physical devices uh, uses uh, a project called Comfy in them, so, so that makes them running Erlang nodes, basically. We have had customers saying that 90% of the traffic goes through Erlang controlled nodes. Um, Again, don't, don't fact check me on this. And, um, and it doesn't run through the Erlang code, but it runs through code that's been configured by Erlang, basically. Uh, we have, um, of, the, of the SPs out there, and SPs are the, the service providers, the top eight one uh, uses uh, our products. Maybe, maybe top nine of these days, I don't know, these numbers are from 2008, but there aren't that many new service providers out there that could be customers, so, so I'm guessing these numbers are f still fairly, uh, fairly uh, truthful. And also the top uh, eight uh, network equipment providers also use our products and, and uh, therefore also uses Erlang in their, in their software. Uh, we are seeing a growing number of Erlang programmers within Cisco, uh, mainly because they bought us, of course, and also due to the fact that we are hiring more people in Stockholm, and we're also seeing an, a small interest here in the Bay Area within Cisco for, for uh, mainly inspired of what we did, but also they want to use our products more efficiently, and then they want to, instead of using the APIs to talk to our products, be inside the, the Erlang VM that uh, our, our products runs on. But it's a, still a small, small but growing community within Cisco. Okay, so... ConfD, that's being developed in, in Stockholm still. We'll, we'll start with that product. That product basically was the first main product developed by uh, TLF back in the days. And, and um, the goal of the product is to open up uh, the network for um, programming interfaces and automation. So um, the problem back then, and still is, I guess, is the state of the art for most of providers most of the equipment providers out there was that um, when when the when the so the configurations of the equipment that they did didn't have any programmatic APIs to them. They they usually had a simple CLI or something like that. So in order to configure them, you had to go in manually to do that. And someone probably handed you a sheet of Excel sheet paper or a paper of commands that you needed to run handed it over to a network engineer that went into the device and, and manually configured it. Or if they were uh, savvy enough, they, maybe they did some uh, CLI uh, screen scraping to try to automate that a bit. 
the other problem the industry was having when, when they developed their uh, equipment was that they usually developed their um, device with like a certain specific use case that they were really good at. And they had a simple CLI. But as time went on and they got customers, they needed more interfaces because the customers demanded that. They, maybe they needed a SNMP interface or, or REST interface or a fancy U, UI or something. And since they hadn't built their products to, to scale like that, they usually just threw that onto the stack on the side causing uh, feature creep, so the CLI had some features, the, the UI had different features, the rest perhaps had a different set of features. Um, so the founders created ConfD, and it's an API layer that you, you put on your box to, to solve both of these issues, to provide uh, a, a way to create your APIs automatically and also being able to program against them. And to do that, they use a, a schema language called Yang, where you define how, what, the, what you can configure on the machine and the constraints for the configurations and all the requirements. And we auto-generate the APIs for you and the different northbound APIs for you. And I will show you examples of that uh, later on. The Yang specification itself is an IETF specification 6020 uh, that we also helped, uh, or some of the people that worked at the startup or at TLF uh, were also authors of that um, specification. Okay, some highlights of the product. Uh, it's primarily, primarily used in physical devices and these days also virtual versions of those devices. And the target base was uh, network equipment providers, so that would be switches, route, routers, and base stations, uh, smart grid nodes. But it could basically be used for anything where you wanted to be able to generate, generate the APIs, because ConfD in itself doesn't do anything but validate, your, uh, validate that the configuration that you provide through the APIs is valid, but we don't act on the configuration. We just store it, basically. Uh, Another requirement w was that it needed to have a very small footprint, so it could be um, used in uh, very, very small devices, uh, not only big ones, um, small, small uh, Wi-Fi hotspots and uh, whatever, or call you its uh, glasses that he talked about yesterday, something like that. Uh, and I, uh, Erlang apparently was, was the language of choice to do this because it's a high-level language, but it has a pretty small footprint. The programs become small and the memory footprint isn't that big either when it's compiled and running. Mm. Right, okay. Um, also, the, 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 apparently in the beginning, Erlang was a secret uh, in terms of the company didn't really talk about Erlang being used in the products because customers back then didn't really want to have a VM running on these small devices that so they didn't trust trust having a virtual machine, so, so um, they didn't lie about it, but they didn't expose it either. The only reason I found out about them was that I had a friend that had a girlfriend back then that worked as a receptionist at a small, strange company where older people who were interested in bird watching and, and this obscure programming language. Uh, and I was like, hmm, tell, tell me more. Um, like I said, we use a data model language called Yang that's used to gener uh, uh, generate the, a database schema and also generate the API. So we generate a CLI, Cisco Universal uh, CLIs for, for the, the user, and as well as some RESTConf, NETCONF, SNMP, JSON, RPC, programmatical interfaces, uh, as well as we have some APIs for, for C integration, Python, Erlang, Java integration. Uh, we use a custom database that we wrote ourselves. Uh, CDB does not stand for custom database. It just happens to be like that in, in this slide here, but it stands for, I think, configuration database. Even though uh, one of the, the guys who wrote Nisha was part of the startup, uh, they, they still decided on going with um, this tree-based XML structured database that fit the, this, this use, use case um, of storing configuration and traverse configuration much better. Um, and the use case would be that normally you would want to 
to add subscribers and, and notifiers on when certain parts of your schema changed, you, your, your code, your callback code got notified. And, and uh, it, it turned out it was easier for us to write our own database to do that. Another nifty feature of the database and, and the ConfD is that we have uh, automatic um, data upgrade if, if we do a schema change. So if someone changes the Yang module that we do to um, um, generate the APIs in the database and uh, follow uh, uh, the strict rules of Yang on how you're allowed to make changes to a Yang module, we will do the automatic upgrading of the, the, the content for you. We, we will uh, make sure that um, uh, you don't have to redo anything. Whatever you had in your database before will be there afterwards as well. Uh, it's fully transactional, and in transactions in our database here or in Comfy means something else than in the, the usual databases out there in terms of um, we treat the transactions as a full class, a first class citizen, and meaning that you can have nested transaction and you can also hook in your code into these transactions in order to react on them. So instead of just waiting for a change to happen in our database, you can hook in your code and make validations and actual do stuff on, on your device before you approve the, the transaction to go through. ConfD uses fairly small uh, data sets because it's, it's used in fairly small uh, um, devices. And uh, there's a free version out there that's called ConfD uh, Basic that you can use if you want to play around with this. So just a small example of what I mean when we generate APIs. I, I thought it would be fun to, to see how that could look. So this, this is a Yang module. I hope it, the colors are, are OK. So this is a very simple Yang module that I created uh, for this conference that shows you how to create your, your schema and the constraints it has. So it's, I just created something called a container, which is just a, a wrapper with a ConfDB SF, a leaf that you can set that would be the date, and a list of sessions, and the name of the session, and who the speaker is. And for some reason, you can only have max five speakers, so I don't know why I did that, but that's. Uh, this is the CLI of, of uh, ConfD, and I pre-populated it with some data. I threw a Victoria under the bus. I hope that's OK to use your name here. Um, on the top part of the screen, of this, of the screen you'll see the uh, Juniper style CLI that we have, and I just do a show command to show you the content of our database. And we can see that we have a date and two sessions. Uh, Cisco use of Cisco is, is the wrong name, but uh, I, I was stressed when I wrote this. And uh, Victoria session is Think in Erlang. And then the red square that there shows me switching the CLI, uh, basically transforming the CLIs that you're into a Cisco style CLI instead, and then I'm doing the, the equivalent for a Cisco style CLI to show the content in, in a different format. So, so here you see two of the APIs for the same, two of the uh, auto-generated APIs for, for the same uh, uh, configuration. This would be the REST conf uh, equivalent of, of the same where, where you get the JSON response. You can also get the XML response if, if that's what, you're, what you want. And for fun, show you how the Python API would, would look for, for traversing the same type of data. So all this you just get for free by, by having this Yang module and, and, and then storing the, the configuration in, in ConfD. And we give you the APIs for it. So nothing that you need to do as a customer when you're adding more, uh, more schema to your Yang module. Everything just gets uh, out generated. OK, so that was the first product that started it all. Next is, uh, is a product that I think is the, the main reason that Cisco acquired us. It's called NSO, also created in Stockholm, also still maintained in Stockholm, also written in Erlang. Uh, so here we move up the stack a bit. So it's ConfD solves the issue with creating APIs for you on your device level and, and allowing you to program against it. But if you have several devices or, or in your network, which you use, usually have, or hundreds or thousands of devices, uh, you still have the problem of, of um, uh, even though if you write the code to program against them, 
uh, you still need to understand how, how, each, how each interface, how each device, um, what kind of language the interface, uh, the, um, the device speaks, for example. So we wanted to solve that as well in, to, to create this NSO, that's a network service orchestrator, which acts as a orchestrator of devices in your network. Uh, this, the same state of art was true here, that, that was a uh, screen scraping or manual, uh, manual configuration that was needed whenever you needed to do a change in your network. Uh, so with NSO you get a single entry point to your network, you add your devices in NSO, you get a unified data structure of what you can configure in your network, and uh, the same with Comfty, you get all the APIs uh, generated for you. Another thing that we solve in NSO is that even though you can program now against all your devices, what if something, if, what if you mess up, if something goes wrong, how, how would you go back? Because a, a human being going into a device and changing configuration, that's easy, but knowing what he did, if he wants to backtrack, that's harder. How would he remember what the configuration was before he did his changes? So that's where NSO has another function that I will show later on that helps you solve this. So, it so basically it creates a, a device abstraction, a unified view of all the devices that you have in your network, regardless of what northbound APIs those devices have. Uh, yeah, so like I said, the network API is the abstraction layer on top of the devices, and you get a programmatic control of them. Um, one key element that we wanted to solve with NSO was that we wanted it to be easy to program against the network. So we wanted it to be... So one of the, one of the problems that you have with, with, with configuring a lot of bunch of different devices is that it's pretty easy to add configuration to devices. You just go into each device and just add a configuration to create your VLAN or whatever network that you're trying to create. But the issue is, how do I reverse that or how, how do I update that? How do I know which devices that needs to be touched again and make sure that I can remove the configuration I created? So we, we created a model to uh, allow the, the developer that works with NSO to only have to do the creation of the configuration and we will make sure that we understand how to do the reverse, how to delete or how to update the configuration. This time it's, it's a, a fairly large configuration set that you would have since you could have hundreds of thousands of devices controlled by NSO. So the memory footprint isn't as important anymore. You, you, you run NSO on huge hardware. So, so the constraints aren't there in, in the same way. You get a two-phase commit um, kind of transactions through your network, even though the devices might not support transactions. We kind of hide that from, from the user and then make sure that everything goes through or, or nothing goes through in the transaction. Uh, we have a scaling model when, when for some reason, one NSO can't, uh, can't, can't um, handle all the configuration you have. You can have several NSOs in a, in a hierarchy. So you can, an NSO can configure and control another NSO, for example. Uh, the same way with Yang, we need a data model for all the um, devices that we have, so we can, whatever the, the device speaks, we need to have a Yang module to describe what you can configure on the device, so we can create that unified uh, API for you. It has the same code base as ConfD, so I think 80% or something of the code is shared between ConfD and NSO. Uh, these days, uh, since uh, the network can be slow when, like I said, that either the entire transaction goes through or it fails, but if devices are slow, which they, they can be in a huge network, um, we have something, a, a concept to give you something similar to a um, eventual consistency database structure instead that we try to, to push everything out to the devices, but if a device is slow, we, we will still not hold up upcoming transactions, so we, we uh, if, if you value throughput instead of consistency, we, we have that option as well. And there's also a free version of this. Uh, small example here as well. Now, uh, still a CLI, but now you're seeing um, the NSO CLI instead. 
and I have two devices, one called SF and one called Stockholm, and there, and they already have some configuration under them with some default values for for when the code beam, code beam SF for some reason, code beam is is being held. Okay. If so, if you look at the, the red in the red square here, I have a small service, and the service is the abstraction layer that you can create above your configuration to, to make a simplified abstraction. This is a pretty st stupid service because it's a one-to-one -one mapping basically in the abstraction, but in theory you could, you could have services that set up a VLAN and, and, and with your very few uh, configurational parameters, and, and we make sure that we go to all the 30-something devices and configure them with the right uh, configuration. But here I have a service called First Try, where I um, name my, my uh, session and the speaker and the date, and I select which device this is happening or which location in this case this is happening, so in Stockholm. And the effect that has on the network is that we are going to the device called Stockholm, we are removing the old date, and we are adding the new date, and we are adding the session that I'm a speaker. And that's all good and dandy, and then I commit that, and, and that has then happened in the network. Later I realized that I need to, okay, it became small. But then I realized that I'm actually talking in San Francisco, not in Stockholm. So in the red square there, you're seeing me correcting that mistake by uh, changing the service device to SF from Stockholm. And the only change that happened in my service is that the old value Stockholm is removed, the new value SF is added, but in the network, we figure out, or NSO figures out, that it needs to delete the configuration on the old device called uh, Stockholm, add back the date, and then create the configuration on SF instead. Looks kind of simple, but no other product out there does this yet. So um, from a programming perspective, that this is kind of straightforward maybe, but from, from like the network industry, this, this blows their mind for some reason. Uh, and this is just to, to validate that the configuration actually ended up on the devices. How do we integrate with customer code? For, for both these products, uh, we, we use um, the Socket API, Loopback Socket API to, to, um, for, for the customers to hook it into the transactions or to speak with, with our uh, uh, software. And, and they usually use C or Python or, or Java to do that, although we also have an Erlang API that they can use for either if they have an external Erlang VM they want to use to talk to our products, or if they for some reason want to be part of our Erlang VM, they can do that as well. I think no customer really does that, but we do it internally in the products that, that we create in, at Cisco that uses these products, around these products, but customers don't use that. Apparently, we also allow customers to, to write their own NIFs, but um, I haven't seen that, so I, I can't give you any details about that. We don't have an Elixir API, but it would be fairly simple to add that if, if we get some Elixir savvy employees one day. 95% of the code is written in Erlang in these products. Uh, roughly 6,000... Uh, 6, 150,000 lines of Erlang, give or take, if you don't count. So these numbers are actually from 2018, so I added a plus sign after each one to, to illustrate that it's probably more these days, but not that much more, especially not on the Erlang side. Uh, we use about 30 applications. Um, from OTP, and we use the JAWS web server. Those are, I think, the main, the main um, applications that we use. And uh, since it's an Erlang company, we use it for basically anything or, and everything, more than we should, I think. But um, whatever, whenever we need to write something, a test engine or compiler or, or whatever, we, we, we end up writing it in, in Erlang. Uh, even though we, we do have some C code in there for, for low-level stuff and, and uh, some of the, the, the lexing for our compiler, for example. And JavaScript, of course, is used for our web UI that's generated. 
Uh, like I said, we only use a handful of the API applications. Uh, we don't use Amnesia. We don't use distributed Erlang. We are very slow in, in adding new language additions. So um, we're also very, or we used to be super slow in, in just using newer versions of OTP. These, this, uh, these times I think we're only two or three versions behind. So currently we are on version 20. The main reason for us being that slow not only in, the, in upgrading OTP, but to use the new features is that we need to be backwards compatible and, and our customers, when they buy their products, they, they are not very likely to upgrade to new versions. So we need to be able to backport our code in newer versions of our product to, to older versions. So, so we can't introduce maps, for example, that easily because it, it will be a huge head headache when we want to backport. Comparison with other languages. So th this was before my time at the company, but apparently they did try to rewrite uh, write NSO in Java first, but uh, gave up after six months because it became too difficult. They claimed it couldn't be done. Uh, I think there's some truth in that, but I also think they were very biased to, to Erlang. Uh, and also, they, apparently, they wrote a, a protocol implementation on NetConf in C, but gave that up as well because it, it was too much work. So everything is Erlang. OK, so if I go to what we do here in San Jose instead, in, in California, uh, there are two main products um, that uses Erlang here. The first is called NFEO. And a little background on what, what this is. Um, there's a working group called Etsy that has uh, um, invented a, an architecture for how to manage uh, virtualization of, of the, the, the network. And so this is the stack that they created and a bunch of different components that they think are needed. So you need a network, uh, or an orchestrator, and you need a manager, a lifecycle manager for the v VNFs, and VNFs are, are virtualized functions. So that could be a router switch or whatever, whatever application that, uh, that runs in, in some virtualized way, either on OpenStack or VMware or on Kubernetes or something like that. So we tried to, to um, when Cisco wanted us to build software to um, fit into this architecture, we managed to do that. Uh, oh, this was a, okay. We managed to do that by, by firstly, we can have the Confti ap uh, application in the VNFs themselves. So that would be the virtualized functions in the network. We have NSO that acts as the uh, um, management systems. We use a, another product that's not built by us actually, but it's built by Cisco, but not our apartment, that, but it uses Confti as well, called ESC. And then we have the NFVO and NSO that we use as the orchestrator. And, and um, yeah, it all comes together like that. What this problem is, is it's, it's needed to be able to create virtual functions, spin up the, fun spin up the v VMs in the network, and um, add them to NSO and later on manage the devices. And so the NFEO is uh, a service in NSO that creates an abstract abstraction layer of the Etsy compliant um, APIs that they've come up with. And then southbound, we talk with either Etsy standard devices or devices that are not standardized at all, but, but we do the mapping logic. So from a customer perspective, everything seems to be Etsy standardized. Its functionality is to create and delete and update virtual network functions and then add them to NSO so NSO can manage the devices. And due to the nature of uh, uh, virtual machines that they need to be started before you can talk to them, uh, this product actually pushes a lot of the um, eventual consistency features that we see in NSO today. So you, you, you create a device, you need to wait for the device to be started on, on OpenStack, for example, and then you add it to NSO, and then you push configuration to it. So everything does not happen at once. We, we actually need to wait for events to happen. So it's event-driven more, more than, than transactional. Uh, and it's, it's uh, another record, I guess, for, for or um, a world record for um, Erlang is that these products are now used in a huge Japanese uh, new um, service provider in the world's first end-to-end -end fully virtualized cloud-native mobile network ready for 4G and 5G. Um, I think they have like something like 50,000 virtual devices that they spin up through this software here. 
This product is mainly written in Python because it's, it's mainly a service on top of NSO, so there's no point for us using um, Erlang. We just create the, the mapping logic, but we do use Erlang in parts of it due to the fact that we need to have a web server that responds to, to uh, something called Sol3, which is a REST API that's needed southbound. And since we don't want to introduce a new uh, web server in our application, we just want to use the one we already have. We use the Erlang's uh, code to, to create a new uh, JAWS app mod to, to be able to create this. The next product that we have is called the PMP. Um, I won't talk much about this, but it's kind of interesting because we, in this, in this uh, project, uses both NSO and ConfD. We use uh, NSO to create a server, and we use ConfD to provide a, a uh, NSO to create the service, and, and ConfD to use the, to create a, a server part of it. What it does is basically that when you plug in a device in the network, it has something called a PMP protocol. So it does a call home to a predefined IP address to get its day zero configuration. So it then calls our PMP server. We provide it with the, in, its initial configuration. We then tell our NSO layer that this device is now available in the network, and then we add it to NSO and start manage it, managing it. Some of the highlights for this product is that it uses both NSO and ConfD, like I said. And um, here, almost everything is written in Erlang because the Python part or the service part is very thin, but the Erlang part, the, the actual functionality of the PMP server is written in Erlang. Uh, and that's, that's all I had to say. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, do you use Erlang for actual routing of packets anywhere? No. So, so we only use it for creating the configuration, and then it's up to the customer code to usually, I guess, written in C or, or some low-level language to, to handle the actual um, uh, traffic. Great. Thanks. I was wondering, a uh, percentage of code written in Erlang and in Python, mm. what, what, is it line uh, character or <laughs> how, how does it calculate? <laughs> it, it, it's just lines. <laughs> we just did a grab of lines. All right, I see, because I know when we rewrote some stuff from Python into Erlang, it mm -hmm. was like 300 lines into two. Okay, yeah. I mean, yeah, you can write everything in one line, I guess, if you, if you want to. Oh, the same size. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Else? All right, take a quick little break for the next talk. All right, Simon. thank you.